Hello! I'm here today to talk a little bit about She of the Mountains by Vivek Shreya. So, She of the Mountains is a really incredible book. Uh, it has illustrations by Raymond Biesinger, and it's made up of a double narrative. What I read as being the primary narrative is one about a boy who is navigating his um, sexual identities, which are dictated a lot more by people who are outside of him than um, than by himself, at least at first. And also somebody who is very aware of his identity as a person of Indian descent in a predominantly white uh, society. The second narrative is a mythological retelling of the myth um, of the goddess Bhavarti, the god Shiva, and their child Ganesh. So this narrative explores similar themes. Each narrative supports the other. Um, the mythological retelling I saw more as being about um, the effect of outside violence upon the body and the way that that sort of um, affects constructions of self. But above all, um, both of these narratives are about love. Whether that be self-love or love between individuals that has the power to kind of overcome violence and trauma, um, to kind of take parts of oneself that may feel disparate and make them unified and familiar. So not only is Vivek Shreya a talented writer, but he also works with um, music and film and performance and, and he's something of a cultural spokesperson. Notable past projects include a collection of stories called God Loves Hair and a sort of documentary film called uh, What I Love About Being Queer. So She of the Mountains carries over themes from his larger body of work, but it is its own piece of art, very unique and, and incredibly beautiful. And not only is Vigshaya's use of language very um, masterful, really, and, and very honest, but the, the novel is sort of complemented by these illustrations by Raymond Biesinger, which are just stunning and sort of um, capture something of the abstraction and limitation of, of representation. So the primary narrative tells the story of an unnamed boy who, as he's growing up, is told by the people around him that he is gay, before he even really knows what that means, and before he's ready to take on an identity like that on his own. However, later on, it is an identity that he does take on, um, a means of sort of classifying himself, although he does so um, hesitantly, uh, because he feels like it's a term that doesn't cover all that he is, doesn't doesn't make sense for each part of himself. And indeed, um, later on in the novel he meets uh, a woman at university who he ends up falling in love with and they share a very passionate sexual and romantic relationship and for the course of the novel um, the protagonist is working to kind of reconcile what his life is like, who he is with the sort of um, categories that are imposed upon him by others. So throughout the novel, these categories that are imposed upon him and these forces that are working on him from the outside manifest themselves uh, on a physical level. The power and knowledge that are circulated around and about him um, are exercised on the body. And I can't use these terms in this way without talking a bit about Michel Foucault. So I'm just going to do that really briefly. The way that bodies are classified and regulated are ways of disciplining modern subjects. These are ideas that theorist Michel Foucault really, really grapples with, and he is an off-sighted theorist who talks a lot about power and knowledge, surveillance, ways that these sort of things are enacted upon the body, the way the bodies are, um, are kind of marked in a way that we we know who's deviant and who's not, and we all kind of surveil ourselves or, or um, keep watch. In the history of sexuality, he engages with this idea called um, biopower. So what Foucault's interested in when he's talking a little bit about biopower is that he's um, saying that we have these large governing societal forces um, that work upon us and the way they do that is by categorizing and classifying bodies and sexuality in such a way that, and that, that they are able to kind of have and circulate power and knowledge. Sexuality is a way that, that we do that and I, we're, it's something that we're all very aware of and I can think of my own, um, my own past, my history growing up and how obsessed everyone was with who is straight and who is gay, or who is bi. Um, and even like in terms of celebrity culture, that is such a huge deal. And, and when you think about that, when you think about these categories and classification systems that we, we say whose sexualities are, 
are permitted and whose are not. When we're curious or when we're concerned about who is straight or who is gay or who is not, we can see the way that classifications of sexuality really don't have a lot of power over us. So which bodies or sexual identities or gender identities are valid and which are deviant? Why do we think this is so? This is the way that we're managed and put into controllable groups. And this is how we know who's deviant and who's not. And he's interested in the way that these governing systems have power and knowledge over the subjects because they're constantly monitoring and watching. So we can see the way that we're all being monitored and those of us who are deviant um, are either removed or improved. Like the deviant body can be pointed out and it can be found. So Foucault writes, no power is exercised without the extraction, appropriation, distribution, or retention of knowledge. At this level, we do not have knowledge on the one hand and society on the other, or science and state. We have the basic forms of power knowledge. So to sum up, Foucault is kind of interested in the way that social power and governing power reinforce each other. So it's important to know that we are constantly under surveillance and that we begin to surveil ourselves. Not only are we able to discipline ourselves, but we're also on the watch for who or what is deviant because these are values that are imposed on us, fears that are imposed on us, as embodied modern subjects. In She the Mountains, the protagonist is aware of the way that his difference or deviance is um, being manifested on the body, and when he does so, he's invoking it's this kind of Foucaultian language. What else could he do but return his surveillance to his body, which now appeared to him as ugly, and appropriately so? He told himself that every zit on his cheeks forehead, nose, shoulders, and back was a punishment he deserved for the abnormality beneath his skin. He blamed his hands and their desire for touch, and in response his hands lost their desire to touch his body at night. He tried to forget about his wrong penis, disgusted by both its misdirected longing when erect and its pathetic floppiness when soft, and in response his penis shriveled up, forgetting about him. So he surveils himself, and he recognizes that because of societal forces that are imposed upon him that he is deviant, and then he disciplines himself. He blames his hands and their desire for touch, and in response, his hands lose their desire to touch. He feels disgusted by his own sexual interests, which results in his penis forgetting about him and disappearing. Not physically disappearing, but that interest is gone. He knows that he's deviant, and he punishes himself. So later on, when the protagonist does take on the identity is gay, this category that has been imposed on him throughout his youth. Um, when he takes that on, he realizes that the proper way to be gay is policed just as heavily and in, in an equally embodied way. The only other gay knew everything about being gay. Conversation generally centered around words like top, bottom, cut, uncut, and questions like who does your hair? And what is your favorite Madonna CD? He found out that he was a bottom because of his slender build and feminine features, and would have to get used to having penises up his bum, even if the thought terrified him. He wondered how gay he could really be when he couldn't relate to anything he was learning about his supposed self. For instance, what did circumcision have to do with being gay? By looking at his body, gay men know things about him and know what category to place him in. Whether or not that's something that he does for himself. Later on, um, there is a passage wherein the protagonist is waiting for a man who passes by a certain point of the university at the same time, at a certain day, and he's waiting. And when he talks about this, he, he also invokes this kind of surveillance language. So the protagonist stopped on the side of the corridor that bridged the law building to the university mall and pretended to look for something inside his bag, but what he was looking for was up ahead. Any second now, that guy was going to walk by. They would do the gay dance with their eyes. Stare, look away. Stare, look away. Each modeling for others' hidden camera. No smile, in case the other wasn't gay or wasn't interested. In Alberta, the combination of a stare and a smile from one man to another, however brief, could be dangerous. He couldn't allow himself to forget this. So there's an element of performance when the protagonist is trying to catch the hidden camera of the guy who he's interested in, but at the same time he knows that there are other hidden cameras. There are other people who could be watching and who might recognize the deviants and who might discipline him. So he's aware of how he has to behave in order to evade detection. 
So on top of this, he's not only aware of how he might be categorized as a queer individual, but he's also aware of how he might be categorized as a person of color in a predominantly white society. He was in a brown category that was generally frowned upon by other brown people, especially other brown parents, alternative brown. This meant he wore vintage clothing, had his ears pierced, had blonde streaks, and hung out with non-browns. In some ways, he was more brown than anyone he knew. When given the choice of restaurants to go to on his birthday, his craving for deep-fried cheese cubes mixed with peas trumped burgers or pizza. He listened to Santour on Saturdays when he cleaned his room and understood the complicated, often multi-storied significance behind most Hindu celebrations, like Deepavali and Onam. He thought Sanskrit was the most beautiful language he had ever heard, and found the constriction of English translations which exposed the general apathy of English itself deeply disappointing. Prima was so much more expansive and sacred than love. And yet, brown in and of itself had not yet registered as a real color to him. Brown was unremarkable, a non-color, akin to a shade of gray. For he had been blinded by another color, White. White expanded limitlessly and drained every other color out until all that could be seen was white friend, white actor, white teacher, white neighbor, white inventor, white stranger, white actress, white co-worker, white singer, white principal, white friend, white actor, white teacher, white cashier, white neighbor, white stranger, white server, white postman, white classmate, White bully, white rock star, white friend, white friend, white king, white queen, white teacher, white model, white conqueror, white savior, white woman, white prime minister, white doctor, white real estate agent, white neighbor, white friend, white professor, white god, white air steward, white man, white scientist, white dentist, white, 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 white. White, 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 and so on. It goes on. So even the way that race is embodied in this book, like it's marked on his skin that he is a brown person, as he says, but he's the wrong kind of brown person, living in a world where to be brown at all is sort of to be non-white. So there are very interesting and complex things being said about race and about representation. Um, and it's just a brilliant novel. Like, there's so much to go into, and I don't have time to go into everything, but there's so much to say about sexuality, about race. Uh, I didn't even touch the, the mythological retelling, but that's very, very rich in itself, and they complement each other so, so well. It's such a beautiful novel, and it's slim, but there's so much to really engage with in the text. And, and for me, it was such a breath of fresh air to read this. Uh, something really needed in the Camlet scene and and even in the in the queer Camlet scene and this might say more about me as a reader but it just felt so important to me because I'm so used to seeing um, a certain type of queer narrative which is you know the experience of a white gay man or a white lesbian um, with a few other representations kind of on the margins but not told quite as often or quite as loudly and She the Mountains is a bisexual love story about people of color. And I was so happy to see that it does away with a lot of the things that I am used to seeing. Literature that is dominated by white voices and white experiences and, and characters who are all cisgendered individuals and who all build their relationships in a heteronormative paradigm. So this was just a incredible. So let me know in the comments if you've heard about this book or if it interests you or if you just want to talk about policing of bodies, we can do that. And don't forget to check out Vivek's other work. Follow him on social media, I'll leave all his links below. And if you want to be my pal on the internet, I'll leave my links below as well. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Go check out this book and then talk to me about it. Okay, till next time. Bye. Till next time, I am not old. Not old.